you're listening, and even watching in some cases, to Andrew Hort's Rock Revival. We're here on Podomatic, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, Audible, and now also Twitch, live. Hello everyone watching live. Um, so I think at the moment that's just me. And um, everyone listening on the podcast and on the VOD on YouTube later on, thank you ever so much for this. I've had quite a day, and I needed to come and just talk about something fun. You know, it's been a tough, long week. It's been a long day. And then we had a hole in the ceiling in the kitchen, which sucks. Um, yeah, there's a there's a leak. All kinds of chaos ensued. And then um, it got fixed, but yeah. So now I'm I'm here, I need to vent, because I was supposed to be out playing games tonight. I was supposed to be out with my Magic the Gathering crew, playing some Magic, um, face to face. Oh my god, face to face. So um, that didn't happen, and I just need to de-stress. I need to chill a bit. I need to enjoy some time hanging out with like-minded individuals like you, so... If you're not familiar with the show, I'm Andrew Horton. Here's a little pod history. I used to work for Power Play Rock and Metal magazine here in the UK, interviewing rock stars. Did that for nine years, interview, uh, interviewing rock stars, reviewing albums and gigs and things like that. And I miss it. So after that, I started this podcast recently to, uh, you know, scratch the itch of talking about music that I love. So I cover obscure and classic albums in the rock and metal genres, mainly from the 80s and 90s. I think that covers it all. Um, you can find a lot of my other stuff that I'd get up to over on uh, Planet Hex on my YouTube channel. I write things, lots of things. But anyway, we're here to talk about music. Now, I've picked two albums tonight that they don't really go together. They don't gel well. There isn't a theme between these two albums. They're just really important records to me, and I just wanted to give them some love. Now, these are also two of the albums that I still have on vinyl. Now, I don't currently have a turntable. We don't really have the space for one at the moment, but I do intend on getting a turntable again soon. So these are both albums that I have on multiple formats. And that's a good sign of something that's going to last with you, really. If it's on multiple formats, you know you're going to uh, have that album for a good long while. So the first one I'm going to talk about tonight, of course, this is all pre-grunge. It's pre-alternative rock, so it's right up my street. This is the classic... Um, classic rock, melodic rock, AOR sort of night, but with a twist as well. What am I saying? Andrew, talk about some music instead. So the first album tonight is going to be Transcendence by Crimson Glory. Now, Crimson Glory. What can I say about Crimson Glory? They were amazing. In my eyes, I think they were glorious. In many ways, they were a wonderful, wonderful band. The vocalist on this album, Transcendence, Midnight, is just stupendous. Unfortunately, Midnight passed away a few years ago, but that's uh, so they couldn't really ever get back together after after what happened with one of their, their later albums, like Strange and Beautiful. They kind of went away after that. But this album, Transcendence, I have it here. I have my original vinyl copy here that I've had since the 90s. Um, and I love this album dearly. I have it on vinyl, I have it on CD, I have it on download, and it's just something I always want with me because it has everything that I needed at the time. It has everything I needed, and that is a running theme with all these albums that I'm, I talk about on the show. It's always stuff that I needed right at the right time, and this is just stupendous. The cover does remind me, with the, the lady strapped to a rocket shooting lasers out of her eyes, it does remind me a bit of Life Force. If anyone remembers the old uh, 80s horror movie uh, Life Force, I think, believe it was Toby Hooper that did Texas Chainsaw Massacre that made that. But yes, this is Transcenders by Crimson Glory. So there are 10 tracks on it, and uh, it has to be heard to be believed, mainly for Midnight's voice, which was... He was, he was capable of creating notes that were just so incredibly high that, you know, dogs would look up and wonder what the hell was going on. But he had such beautiful diction and this huge sense of theatricality about his voice. You could imagine him doing musicals. And things like Phantom of the Opera, there was something in the diction and the way he put um, the phrasing of his words, which was just incredible. But the thing that most people remember about Crimson Glory is that they wore big silver masks. So, um, 
when they did Transcendence, they had made the masks a little bit smaller. On their earlier albums, they covered the face entirely. But on this album, they had made them a bit smaller. So they covered like half the face. So we can see on the uh, on the internal artwork, we've got Midnight on vocals, John Drenning on lead guitar, Ben Jackson on rhythm guitar, uh, Dana Burnell on drums, and Jeff Lords on bass guitar. And they've all got kind of uh, like superhero masks that almost look a bit like the uh, Ultimate Warriors wrestling mask. But, you know, do you remember the Ultimate Warrior? Who could forget the Ultimate Warrior? Um, but, yeah, this, this album, it has a... The feel of it is not just straightforward rock. It's not just straightforward metal. It is more progressive. Uh, but it is yet it holds the melody very well. It holds the tunage very well. This is a um, a great album for fans of early Queensryche. You know things like you know the warning and Operation Mindcrime, of course, from Queensryche. This uh, there's a really good uh, examples of the sort of thing you would. Um, you could liken this to, but there's something kind of majestic and magical about Crimson Glory that always appealed to me. It really appealed to me, that sense of drama, the mystery behind uh, behind the masks. Yes, I saw, I found this in the mid-90s, in my teenage years, so it was a way, very old hat by then already, but it, it spoke to me, it spoke to me. The first thing I heard off it was Lonely, the single track, Lonely. Um, which is an extremely good song. I still hold it in a very high regard, that tune. But it's not really indicative of the rest of the album. It was chosen as like an MTV video type tune. If you watch the video to Lonely, check out the size of Midnight's hair. By crikey, that needs its own tour bus. It was ridiculous, but yet wonderful. Because it, it was, that was the time. That's what was going on at the time. But that, uh, that song, it had kind of a... It's kind of a it's kind of a love song. It was given a very straightforward sort of rock video um, for the era, but it's not really indicative, as I say, to the rest of the album Transcendence, which was just all over the place in terms of um, creativity and whatnot. Okay, so the album opens. Let's pop this up here. The album opens with Lady of Winter, which from the off you are treated to Midnight's ludicrous range. It's such a high register he can manage, and it's wonderful. It's not piercing, it's more surprising than anything else. It is something that's just glorious to behold, and I love it to bits. That's followed by Red Sharks, which has a, a lovely, punchy chorus, a proper fist-pumping mid-80s metal chorus. Oh, I didn't say when this came out. This came out in 1988 on Roadrunner. Thank you, Roadrunner. You brought us so much good metal in your time, and I really appreciate it. I uh, see so people all over the world, fans all over the world, still appreciate stuff that Roadrunner Records put out. Um, so yeah, after Lady and Wh Lady of Winter and Red Sharks, we get Painted Skies, which is a little more, even more theatrical. If that was possible after those first two tracks, the uh, the guitars are kind of staccato. The drumming is again. Very powerful, but again, still quite staccato. There's a lot of stop and start. There's a lot of time changes throughout this album. It is, for all intents and purposes, a progressive metal album, but it has the more the um, and more of an air of mystery to it, thanks to the masks and the artwork and the entire image and just the mythos around them, just the uh, the charisma and the it's just a very enigmatic band and. They're one of a kind. I know, you know, Masks came back with Slipknot and Mushroom Head and such like. But with Crimson Glory, they were carrying on more in the vein of Kiss. But more of like a, a mystical, spiritual, sci-fi version of Kiss. If you can imagine such a thing, anyway. But uh, Painted Skies was followed by Mask of the Red Death. Again, which really shows off Midnight's vocals. And it is Midnight that is the heart of this album, and I don't think anyone, even the band members, would deny that it is Midnight that is the, the calling card of this album, and this era of Crimson Glory. The, uh, the man had such talent, and such a range, and such power in those vocal chords, it just defies belief. It was really, really crazy performance on all of these songs, and really quite wonderful. Um, after Mask of the Red Death, we've got In Dark Places, which is just, it's something else. It's a bit darker, it's a bit more brooding. I wouldn't say it's a ballad, there aren't really any ballads on this, I, apart from uh, Lonely itself, which kind of get towards sort of rock ballad 
territory. But that's um, by the by. In Dark Places has quite a, a sinister sort of um, sabotage. That's the that's the band I'm thinking of. In Dark Places is a bit more like sabotage in terms of structure and sound. Um, that is followed by the the first track on side two. Remember when things had sides? <laughs> it's where dragons rule, which you know, it's a song about dragons. What do you expect from a, a song with the title "Where Dragons Rule"? Huh? What can I really say about that? Look at that fabulous thing. I really miss playing vinyl. Not because I think it's particularly superior in sound quality or anything like that. I just miss the act of putting it on and trying not to screw the record up by putting the needle on too hard or something like that, you know? It's not the most practical of uh, formats, it's not the best sounding of formats, but hey, it was a format. And it was, um, it gave us that beautiful uh, experience of holding holding the item and enjoying it and enjoying the artwork and enjoying the liner notes and the lyrics while you were listening. So after Where Dragons Rule comes Lonely, which we've covered already, a little ballady, unforgettable chorus though, and a, um, it has a solo structure that I may have stolen many times over when I was in bands. Um, so thanks for that, Crimson Glory. I appreciate that. That's followed by Burning Bridges which is a bit, a little bit more straightforward in comparison to the rest of the album. Um, I think that Burning Bridges gets to more towards them having a straightforward rock song. Uh, that's followed by Eternal World, which is very Queensryche and Savatage put together, followed by the title track, which closes the album Transcendence itself, which is just as majestic as you would expect from Crimson Glory. They are, they were particularly unique band and i do think personally it's a bit of a shame that they lost the masks it's a bit of a shame that they moved away from this progressive metal sound into more of a straightforward rock sound for the album strange and beautiful there were things that followed that but i did lose touch with the band lost i lost touch with the, what was going on with the band for many years just you know life does things like that so that was Transcendence by Crimson Glory, a very unique, very powerful album that sticks with me and I hope will always stick with me. What I will say about it though is that the production sucks. The production is terrible on it. It's got a really weak mix. It's got very little mid in it. The middle ranges in that it's just lousy. But it is a very, very good album. Okay, the second album I want to talk to you tonight on this episode of the Andrew Haunt's Rock Revival show uh, is Giant Time to Burn. Now, just even just saying that fills me with a great deal of joy. Of late, there has been a little controversy in the melodic rock scene with uh, a new Giant album coming out from Frontiers that, again, doesn't have Dan Huff on it. And that's a real shame because he, he to many people, he is giant. So this back, this album, Time to Burn, the second album by Giant, as from, from what I remember. I really should read up more before I do these. But yeah, second album from Giant, uh, and it came out back in 1992 on Sony, oh, sorry, on Epic, uh, run by Sony. So this album, it's one where melodic rock was still being released, even though grunge was the the flavor of the day. Everyone wanted to listen to Pearl Jam or Nirvana and Soundgarden and Tad and Mudhoney and, you know, all the other stuff that uh, that came along then. And that was fine, you know? I, I get it that people needed a palate cleanser, but, you know, my, my palate didn't need cleansing. That sounds oddly rude, oddly like a, a euphemism. But yes, Giant, classic album, classic album. There you see, there's a melodic rock band trying not to look AOR or like a hair band and um, still failing miserably, miserably. <laughs> this was a brilliant album. I discovered, actually, I discovered Giant when they put this album out through the single they released, which was Stay, which I still have. It was like, I got it on CD. So, um... There's four tracks on the single, I believe. It was Stay, which was the uh, the main track on there. And that was followed by the title track, Time to Burn. And then there was um, an acoustic version of Stay. 
and there was Get Used To It. I think it was Get Used To It, uh, which is on the album as well. And that just blew my mind. That single, if you can call it a single, four tracks, it's an EP. Um, because, you know, at the time, the big anthems were, you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit or Even Flow or Alive and things like that. And this offered something different to me. It was like a breath, breath of fresh air. I was big into my heavy harmony rock music, like Def Leppard and so on. And this was glorious. Stay is a beautiful AOR song that, you know, Journey would be proud of. It's a fabulous piece of melodic rock music. It's got a wonderful hook. It's got an enormous chorus. And it has a very tasty guitar solo from Mr. Dan Huffer I've mentioned before. So... The album itself was produced by Terry Thomas, which delights me, which delights me. So the producer was called Terry Thomas, and all I can think of is the mustachioed um, debonair actor from here in England. But it has a marvellous, punchy mix to it, a great production on this album. It's a really powerful, straightforward rock album. It's got a bit less of an AOR feel than uh, their other stuff had, the previous album they put out. It had a bit less of an AOR feel, a bit more of a straightforward um, hard rock sound, but it hadn't lost none of the melody that they were known for. And I love it. Absolutely love it. So the uh, the sleeve, it's got lyrics on it. It's got liner notes. And um, let's have a look at the record. I've not had this out of here in so long. Giants, time to burn on Epic. What a fantastic thing. But yeah, it's it. they had this instantaneous quality to me that just oozed personality, charisma and talent. Um, the production was big and bold and marvellous with huge vocal harmonies, shredding guitar from Dan Huff and the songwriting of the gods, basically. I love this album. I love this album dearly. Um, and the track Time to Burn was also on a, a magazine cassette I remember getting from maybe Metal Hammer or something like that. But that's another thing that you don't see now. Apart from Zero Tolerance, the uh, the extreme metal magazine where you get a CD every issue, it's not really something that you see a lot of in terms of stuff attached to the front. Even Power Play that I, uh, that I wrote for for nine years. Um, hi, Power Play. Even that has a, a download now. When you buy a copy, you can get a download of that month's like compilation album, which is a great idea. And I totally, I totally see why that that happens. But just with the lack of cover CDs and <laughs> cover tapes, and if I'm going really far back, flexi discs, um, I just feel a, no. I don't feel like there's something missing because this is what this people of this era are into and understand and are familiar with, and that's fine. But I just feel everything's getting very far away. Um, so, yes, flexi discs. That's just made me think of a, a very early Kerrang I got that had a um, what was it? It was a Thunder. It was a Thunder track on one side, and um, I think the other side had two short versions of songs. One, for, I think, it was a band called Sweet Addiction. And the other one was uh, RPLA, the Red Patent Leather Angels, doing, I had like clips of songs on the other side, but the main side was Thunder. But I digress. Anyway, Giant. This is a fantastic album. This is an essential rock album. If you've never heard this before, please go and find a, a stream of it on YouTube or anything like that. This is glorious. And when you've listened to it on YouTube, go and find yourself a physical copy and just hold it and bask in its marvellousness. So it starts with a track called Thunder and Lightning, which does everything you would want it to do from a melodic rock song. It's got the big drums, it's got the big guitars, it's got the big hooks. This is a glorious piece of musicianship. It's marvellous. It's followed by Chained. Again, another great rock song. Just, it's hard to describe just the nuances of it because to many it will just sound like a melodic uh, hard rock song, hard rock album, and I get that, I understand it. But when you listen to a lot of these things, you do pick out the nuance of these things, and it's quite special when you find the things that really, really speak to you. So the the lineup on this album, by the way, as mentioned, it's Dan Huff 
on lead vocals, lead guitars, backing vocals, and additional keyboards. You've got Alan Pasqua on keyboards and backing vocals, uh, Mike Brignardello on bass and backing vocals, and Dan's bro David Huff on drums, percussion, and backing vocals. So you can see why people could get annoyed with the, the current version of Giant not having Dan Huff in it because he was basically all of the recognizable parts of Giant and nowhere is that more evident than on this album on Time to Burn. So you've got Lay It On The Line which is a bit more brooding song, then you've got Stay, the, uh, the single I mentioned which is just a great pop rock song. I love it, I love it dearly, I love it to this day and this is like 31 years. 30 years since this came out. 30 years. Oh, God. That's everything. 30 years ago at the moment. I'll try not to knock my microphone over. So, Stay is followed by Lost in Paradise and Smolder. Again, two songs that... They walk all over the other mater material by a lot of other bands. It's You're hard-pressed to find a bad cut on this album. And... That is testament to the exemplary songwriting on here. I mean, Dan would go on to become a very well-known um, producer. I think he was already a producer by that time. I've got a vague memory that he played on Tiffany's album. Remember the I Think We're Alone Now lady? I have a vague memory he played some solos on that and did some production and mixing on that. Correct me if I'm wrong, please do. So he certainly had the, uh, the experience for it. And the songwriting on this is just phenomenal. So after Smolder, you get the title track, uh, Time to Burn, which just from the very moment when it opens with a wonderfully shreddy guitar run, starting up high and heading down low and moving into that bluesy main riff, it's just a beautiful thing. The fluidity of Dan Huff's playing is just a glorious thing. And it's Dan with two ends, by the way, remember that, that's very important. But then it's just furious. Furious. It's a furious song. It reminds me a little bit of um, the Dokken track. Oh, and I've gone blank on it. Uh, it'll come back to me. It reminds me of a very early Dokken track uh, that's just chaotic and marvellous. I will have to remember that's going to bug me now that I can't remember that. It's, I love the track. I love the track and I can't remember the name of it. Um, I'm going to have to go and look it up now. But it's, um, let's go to the discography of Dock, it won't be a second. It holds up really, really well. It's just a powerful album in every way. Production, songwriting, performance, absolutely marvellous. Um, okay, so it wasn't on under lock and key, it was the one before. Tooth and Nail, that's the track. It's Tooth and Nail. So if you know the song Tooth and Nail by Dokken, that is what I feel is um, very much a spiritual um, relative of Time to Burn, the title track, because it's just frenetic and has a guitar solo that makes guitar, so guitar players just go... Rah! That was a weird noise to put on a podcast, Andrew. Well done. So after Time to Burn, it's got I'll Be There When It's Over, Save Me Tonight, There's Nothing Bad Here. The mix of rock, the mix of the harder rock, the mix of the AOR styles, and the more melodic elements to this album are just wonderful. Um, there's nothing quite like it. It's, it's a giant album, and there's no way of really explaining that without you going to check out a giant album. It's very hard to um, put it into words, but I'm trying, and, you know... I hope I'm making a good stab of it. Anyway, it has got a, a nice crunchy guitar tone throughout the album. Uh, so without you, now until forever, uh, I'll follow up again. And again, those later tracks, without you, now until forever, they are still a very high quality, a very high standard of musicianship, but they are not on a par with what came before with things like Time to Burn or Thunder and Lightning or any anything. Um, but it does pick up with the, t the end track, the final track of the album, Get Used To It, which is quite kind of mid-paced, a little brooding as you're nodding along to it. It's not like a, a spectacular um, ending. It's not like an enormous build-up to this track, and then it ends on something epic, because it's just, that's not how Giant rolled. That's not how Giant rolled. They didn't need to. They knew they were good at what they did, and that's fine. This is a fantastic, fantastic, 
fantastic piece of rock music. And I do urge anyone that hasn't heard Time to Burn or indeed any giant music to check it out. The stuff that Frontiers Records is putting out under the current version of uh, Giant without Dan Huff, it's perfectly serviceable. It's really good rock music. It's really good for the fans of AOR, melodic rock, hard rock, classic rock. It's great for... It's it's just a great release. It's, they're really great records, but they're not on a par with what many would see as to be the definitive lineup of Giant with Dan Huff among their ranks. So with that said, that is my two albums for this evening. We had Crimson Glory's Transcendence, a genuine, what I believe, a genuine classic, and Giant's Time to Burn, again, what I believe to be a genuine classic of its own kind. Both on vinyl. I really want to go and play them again now. Whenever I've talked about albums on this uh, on this show, I always want to go and play them again. So, again, this is Andrew Haunt's Rock Revival. We cover we. Why do I say we? Why do I refer to me as we? It's me doing this. No one else. Um, I like to cover albums both both obscure and classic in the fields of rock and metal. And I really hope you enjoy. Um, listening and now watching me talk about these things is greatly appreciated so as you know i do run the channel planet hex i run the uh, the pop culture show there i've also got this the rock revival and a bunch of other stuff going on because i do have a writing career and a full-time job outside this but i've got new books coming out lots of new books coming out this year and lots of new releases i have 12 new releases coming out this year as part of my compendium 2022 project where i release a new have a new proper release every month all year um so I, I like giving myself a challenge and this is proving to be quite a uh, quite the challenge already at this part of the year if you're watching on youtube and you would prefer something audio only please do go check out the audio version of the podcast it's just it's it's this it's this that you see here minus the um title and the credit sequences and uh, that's 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 about it really but if you prefer that it is on audible and spotify and itunes and google podcasts and everything you could possibly think of it's probably on the the cutlery drawer i don't know who knows but i hope you enjoy uh, checking these things out with me and revisiting these things if you've not heard these albums before as soon as this finishes go and check them out go and give them a spin be it on physical media or digital and thank you very much for taking the time to hang out and cheer me up because i've had a rotten day it's been so long it's been a hard week and i really needed to sit down have a drink granted it's pepsi max rather than beer because i forgot to buy beers today and hang out and talk some music with like-minded individuals so i really appreciate that thank you very much for checking out this episode of andrew haunt's rock revival i'm andrew haunt and i'll catch you up and catch oh damn why can i never finish these things properly i'm andrew haunt <laughs> we'll catch up with you soon thanks a lot bye bye Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and validate my existence.